Here's your Bible quiz for the day, but I bet it's an easy one. Say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And the next verse, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. We can't really understand the fourth chapter of John's gospel without looking at the third chapter of John's gospel and the stark contrast between the two. Jesus said that to a man in the third chapter who had come to him under the cover of night. His name was Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. Not a Pharisee who was out to get Jesus, a Pharisee who was seeking the truth, but he came at night because he was afraid of the other Pharisees and what they might do or say about him should they know that he went to talk to Jesus, this radical man that had been upsetting all the Jews in Jerusalem. And Jesus says this to him and also tells him that if he wants to really know what God is, he has to be what? He has to be born again. Now we go from that to chapter four, which if you've heard sermons about the woman at the well, you've probably heard sermons that talk about her like she is one of the shady ladies of scripture. She's there at the heat of the day because the decent women go there when the sun comes up and it's cooler. They go in the cool morning time and she has to go in the middle of the day because she's such a bad woman. She's such a tainted woman. She's such a floozy of scripture. Anybody ever hear a sermon sort of like that or a teaching like that? And that Jesus forgives her? Nowhere in the passage does he forgive her, but he does some other completely unexpected things in this passage, doesn't he? It's one of those stories that we've heard so many times that it's so familiar that sometimes we take it for granted and kind of half listen and think about what we're going to have for lunch later on this afternoon. Or if you're trying to stay awake, you're fighting yourself right now to keep awake. But this is a woman who has had how many husbands, do you remember? Five husbands and living with a man now. Well, what does that make her? We all have a word in our head, right? Maybe a prostitute, maybe an adulteress. Now, it makes her a woman in the first century, probably a barren woman, to be honest, because she had no choice. Now, remember, if a woman was married and her husband died, what did she have to do under the law? Marry his brother so that she might produce a son that would be the son of the original husband. And if he died, she'd marry the next brother and the next brother. More than that, she was probably a divorced woman, which was not a good situation to be in, not because it put her at odds with God, but because it put her at odds with society. Most likely, she couldn't bear children, and the husband she had would push her out until someone else took her in. That was how divorce happened in the first century. She had a sad life, and she doesn't hide it from Jesus, does she? She says, I see her a prophet, because he said, I know you've had all these husbands, and I know you're living with a man who's not your husband now. She says, sir, I see her a prophet. But more than that, she's astounded that he's even speaking to her. Jewish men didn't talk to Jewish women in public if they didn't know them. There were very, very strict cultural mores about such things. And here Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. Now, first of all, it says Jesus had to go through Samaria. That is like saying to get to Baltimore City from Cockeysville, you have to go by way of Pittsburgh. You can get there, but you're going to go the long way around. Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria for any other reason than what he says to Nicodemus in chapter 3. For God did not send his son into where? The world, to condemn the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. And it's a very small world between the Samaritans and the Jews because the gulf was so large between them. They'd hated each other for generations, for centuries. They'd hated each other because of the exile when the Jews were taken into captivity and the Samaritans were left behind. They hated each other because of the slaughter that had happened between the two peoples centuries past. They hated each other because the Jews thought that the temple should be in Jerusalem while the Samaritans put it on Mount Gerizim. And for those of you who are from the Harry Potter generation and speak Harry Potter, the Jews thought the Samaritans at best were mudbloods. For the rest of you going, huh? We'll talk later. So here is Jesus approaching a Samaritan woman in a place he didn't have to go, but he tells the disciples we have to go there because this is part of the world that they don't want to minister in. This is part of the world that they have no use for. This is part of the people that they just look down on 
They won't even say each other's names. They won't acknowledge each other publicly. But this is where Jesus has to go, and he goes to the well of their common ancestor, Jacob, the well that he gave the people, the well that is the place where he met his wife generations before, a story well known to all of them. It's a story about relationship, and Jesus strikes up a conversation that begins a relationship with a woman that no one else would have ever expected him to give the time of day to, much less ask for a drink. Because if you're going to drink from someone else's dipper or bucket, you're going to be sharing their DNA. You're going to be swapping a little saliva with them, and that is not something you do with someone you just test, is it? And then he says to her those strange words, if you had known who you were speaking to, you would have asked and he would have given you living water. You wouldn't be thirsty anymore. And she wants that living water. And she says something to him because she knows he's already a prophet. And she says, we're waiting for the Messiah who's called the Christ. And if you think it's odd that Jesus asks her for a drink, This is the first time he says to anyone who he is. This is a foreign woman. This is a despised woman. This is a shady lady of scripture woman. And he says to her, I am he. And she puts down her water jar. And she runs to tell the people who look down on her from her own village that she has seen God's Messiah revealed. The disciples are standing there going, what's he doing talking to her? They come back, they're astounded. They're just completely aghast at what he's done. How could he be talking to this Samaritan woman? But what does she do? But she shames them because she knows what to do. When you've gotten the good news, when the living water has bubbled up inside of you, you have to let it flow to the next person. And she wants them to know, even if they've mistreated her, because the good news that she received from him is so powerful and life-changing that she can do nothing but run and tell somebody else about the good news of Jesus Christ. All about being thirsty, isn't it? You remember a few weeks ago when we told the story of the multitude going to Jesus on that hillside, the 5,000 men and the women and children coming up to be a crowd of 10,000 people. The disciples say to him, where are we supposed to get food to feed all of them? And he says, okay, we'll, we'll feed them. And they should have remembered the manna in the wilderness, the manna, the word that literally means what is that stuff that God had fed them with. And today, even in their thirst, The disciples are off trying to buy food. They're trying to scrounge up a meal. And Jesus, they're forgetting who he is and what he provides. He is the bread. He is the life-giving water. And he is the rock. They should have remembered that story because here we have Moses again in the wilderness. I really feel so bad for Moses sometimes because here he is, reluctantly called to be a leader. He says, but God, I don't speak very well. He says, well, I'll send your brother. He can do the talking but you're my chosen person. I just need you to go confront the most powerful man on earth and tell him to let my people go to their freedom. And Moses does that, and they get out into the wilderness, and the first thing they do is, we're hungry. Did you bring us out here to kill us? We would have been better off as slaves in Egypt than out here. And now that they've forgotten the manna that they've been given every day, they say, did you bring us out here to make us die of thirst, us and our children? Moses looks at God and says, What am I supposed to do with these folks? I tell you, there is not a pastor on the planet who hasn't had that thought at one point toward God when it comes to a congregation that can sometimes be a little cantankerous and stubborn itself. What do you want me to do with these people? They're ready to stone me. There's not a pastor alive who hasn't had a moment of feeling that you're going to be stoned standing in the pulpit or maybe walk into your car at night in the dark. And God says... Take the staff, the one with which you parted the sea. That should have made them think, ah, we've seen this stick in action before. And strike the rock, and water will come from the rock. But the most important part of that whole section is a part that we probably don't even pay much attention to. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock. God is there. I will be standing in front of you on the rock. Maybe not in a way that they can see, but in a way that they should be able to feel. Now, he calls the place Masa and Meribah, talking about bitterness. And what is it that the people are saying, is the Lord among us or not? We've just come through a terrible year, haven't we? 
Anybody enjoy this last year? I think I know three people who said, I like to stand at home all the time and just kind of living in my jammies and being on Zoom. Thinking, what's wrong with you? But everybody has their own thing. But have we not had moments of thinking, is God here or is God not with us anymore? Because as people die and get sick and as it goes on and on and on and as people start to argue, we start to lose hope. But that's when we have to remember to eat the bread and the water. Drink the water. Now, for us in our culture, usually bread and water is the beginning of a meal in a restaurant, isn't it? The world is divided into the people who hold off the bread and the people who indulge. Which side are you on? When the bread comes and they put it on the table, how many of you say, I'm not going to eat that. I'm going to wait for my meal to come. And how many of you give in and say, oh, there's hot bread? I went out to eat just a couple weeks ago with a friend of mine. We went to a seafood restaurant that gives you big, huge portions. We were both hungry. They brought bread and put it on the table. And we said, oh, we don't need that. And they said, no, it comes with everybody's meal. They said, and it's our special honey cinnamon butter. We sat there for just a moment. There were three rolls, two people. And he said, let's just have half a roll each. We had half a roll. Then we had the other half the roll. And he said, I'll split the last one with you. And we ate it. We didn't need it. We ate it. Bread and water for us is something on the side, but we got to remember that these are people who never got enough to eat and rarely got enough to drink, and what they got to drink was not all that clean. If you ever pulled water up out of a well and looked at it without a filtration system, you know what I mean. But Jesus is giving them bread and water in abundance to feed their souls for that deep-down spiritual thirst that they were experiencing. So what do we do when we get to the point where we say, either, God, what am I supposed to do with these people, or is the Lord with us or not? We've got to go feed ourselves on the bread of life and drink from the life-giving water that bubbles up in our souls to eternal life. For John, you have to understand, salvation isn't something you experience when you die. And too many Christians, I say this all the time, wait until they're dead to ever realize that they're alive. Salvation begins the moment you understand the depth of God's love for you in Jesus Christ, and it's a life-changing moment because it makes you feel welcomed and loved and embraced and included, something the woman at the well had never experienced because she was born a barren woman in a culture that let her be handed from man to man to man. And here he is, the Messiah. The first time he says to anyone, this is who I am, it is to this woman, and that says so much to me. Because in my need, in my brokenness, in my sinfulness, I have Christ who comes to me. I have God who stands at the mountainside. I have Jesus Christ who is the rock, who is always welcoming me and calling me home. That is powerful. That is powerful to know how deeply we are loved. And that is when our new life begins and continues for all eternity. Thomas Merton is the late, I'm pretty sure he was a Jesuit priest and who lived the life of a monk in a contemplative state for a while. And he wrote a book called Bread in the Wilderness. For him, the bread was reciting the Psalms. There are cloistered groups of monks that will recite the entire book of Psalms. They'll chant them every week. They'll go through all 150 songs or two weeks or every month among their other work. And some people will say to me that a contemplative life is a wasted life because they're not really serving God. I'm glad to know that there's someone who's praying for the world every minute of every day. Aren't you? Every hour they're called to prayer and they stop their work in the fields or whatever work they have to do and they stop and they turn to God in prayer. That is what feeds his soul. Studying the scriptures together is what feeds my soul. Being in worship together is what feeds my soul. It was so hard and thank God for Judy Sutter. Where is she? I saw her out there. Where did she go? There she is, who put your pictures on the pews so when I stood here I could look at your faces when I was preaching to a camera. To be together is wonderful and it feeds us. And sometimes people will say, I have to leave my church because I'm not being fed. And I say to them, how many times have you put yourself at the table in order to be fed? Because you've got to come hungry and thirsty. And you have to come trusting that God will be there on the other side. We've got to look for God in each other. We've got to look for God in the world around us because God is already there. God said, I will be standing before you on the rock. And Jesus Christ is the rock. 
What more do we need, folks? We have this wonderful Savior who loves us in spite of our worst moments and who will reveal to himself to us even at our lowest point. So maybe you felt like the woman at the well. Maybe you feel like you have to go in the heat of the day. It wasn't that she went in the heat of the day because she was embarrassed. She went in the bright sunlight. Nicodemus was a religious insider. He was a Jew who had to go under the cover of darkness. But with her eyes wide open in the bright light of day, she says to Jesus, I know you're a prophet, and we're waiting for the Christ. And he says to her, this is who I am. So go into this sunny day to share Christ with everyone you meet. Let the living water overflow from you to someone else. Don't hoard your toilet paper or your bread, but feed someone in the name of your Savior, and you will find that you are full and satisfied and overflowing with the grace and the peace and the love of our Savior. In his name and to his glory, amen.